thank you very much uh, and byrock for this meet the master series and uh, we've had some excellent quality talks from uh, tinsha anand joshi and sachin himself so let me move on to athul ataje um, this is a, a procedure that we have come to be identified with um, requires a lot of diligence and uh, relentless uh, tenacity um, because it's a long surgery and uh, it's complex i'm just going to move on and quickly start i have eliminated the diagnostic round because we want to include maximum steps in the 20 minutes that we are doing now so here we have switched the scope into anterior um, d portal so anterior lateral portal and for the sake of the audience uh, we are doing the left shoulder and i have now uh, shown you a sketch of the position of the scope and the surface markings my radio frequency is coming in from the eye portal the inferior portal and i have come in and cleared the anterior glenoid that you see here i have actually maintained the labrum here and detached it right up to the 6 o'clock position and detached it from the top because i'm going to preserve and then hopefully do a banka repair at the end of my procedure but i need to improve my visualization and hence i'm going to park my labrum in the posterior portal so here i bring in my grabber take the top end of the post of the labrum and park it posteriorly behind so that i have a clear view of the structures then i move in to the coracoid and my scope is now again in the e portal so this is between the i and the d so it's an anterior lateral portal in the mid section i have identified the coracoid here and i have identified the conjoint i need to free up all the tissues and adhesions between the conjoint and the deltoid but we need to be careful because you need to know your structures around the coracoid like the back of your hand the axillary and the muscular cuticles are right there in the neighborhood and you don't want to so i'm now proceeding to resect the medial part of the coracoid which is the pec minor tendon so with the radio frequency hugging the coracoid without trying to go anywhere medial to the pec minor because that is where the muscular cuticles nerve is but we need to go a fair bit down to free up the coracoid because a lot of the pec minor merges with the conjoint tendon so one has to be very careful here that one doesn't harm the conjoint tendon because that is very important to our dynamic stability on to the latage till the last fibers of the pec minor are resected the pec minor will not retract and it's important for us for us to have it retract because that will allow us to be able to visualize the musculocutaneous nerve there and it is mandatory that you at least in this procedure identify the musculocutaneous and the axillary nerve the two nerves are important sometimes you would also see the radial nerve if possible so once we have mobilized this nicely under vision uh, scope is still in the anterolateral portal uh, in the e portal and then we are removing all these tissues this is all the entire clavipectoral fascia that is obscuring your view at the same time we've got an excellent view of the conjoint tendon which is hanging on to the promontory of the coracoid all the way down here so this is an analog of tissue on the back end of the coracoid it's an extension of the biceps it is not important and that's why we are going to clear it because that gives us real estate for us to put in our both the screws but it is important not to confuse this with the conoid trapezoid ligament which are in a vertical fashion which go on the top end of the coracoid in this direction this is actually across orthogonal to the conoid and trapezoid now we come underneath the coracoid underneath the conjoint and you can use the wisingerod to lift up the conjoint tendon to make space and remove all this clavipectoral fascia and the subscap bursa in front we are right in front of the subscapularis and sometimes you can have the significant amount of tissue here you must be able to discern between the clavipectoral fascia the bursa and the subscap the subscap is a pretty strong structure which is dense white this is my wisinger rod coming in <clears throat> from the top d portal so this is the high anterolateral portal and this will come in under the conjoint lift up the conjoint so that we can get a fair picture here and then you can see my rod come out here through the split here just to mark the split and then 
up here in the corner here at around nine o'clock, we expect to see the accelerator now. So progressively use the back end of your radio frequency without uh, pressing the coag or the cutting buttons and just use it as a probe to allow us to remove the facial tissue. And then you should see a nice white broad structure there as the axial nerve, which will be identified in a minute here. Once you've identified the axial nerve, like here on the bottom right picture, you can see that underneath the facial tissue, then you know where to start your subscap split from. So you start from the tip of your visinger rod and start moving from medial to lateral, but ensure that you're going parallel to the subscap fibers. You don't want it to go in a cockeyed fashion because you can then uh, accidentally do a tenotomy of the subscapularis. It's important that your split ought to be upper two third, uh, lower one third. So basically in the inferior sector of the subscapularis, right close to the tendon, but not uh, encroaching on the biceps tendon. You don't want to damage the pulley and the biceps there. So as once you've got a fair amount of window, uh, then you know that your split is done. And I think amongst the 10 critical steps of the Arthur the subscap split and the final fixation remain two daunting tasks. The rest is pretty straightforward and predictable. We usually divide our steps in 15 minute intervals so that you know that you're focused and achieving everything on time. So once the split goes through, then half your job is done and then we'll proceed to making the M portal. So M portal is related to the split. So we've gone back through the rotator interval, left shoulder, glenoid in front of you, humerus on the lateral side. The Wissinger rod will pass through the lower sector of the subscap. You can use five o'clock of the glenoid as a good landmark and allow it to come through the split there. So it's important to make this accurately because this Wissinger portal from the posterior portal is going to dictate the path of your cannula and the screws. And this has to be significantly medial, but that is exactly why you need to identify the axial nerve because invariably this rod actually kisses the axial nerve and comes out. So if you've got a fair idea and you've identified the axial nerve, then that's not a challenge. So, so now coming to the coracoid drill, once you've done the split, you come back into the eye portal. So this is the portal in line with the coracoid. And then you come and identify and then do the S portal, which is the needle coming in from the top end. And you're watching right underneath the coracoid. You're in line. It's very important to align along the straight end of the coracoid because the coracoid is a very peculiar bone. It's in a three-dimensional twist and it's not lying flat as you would imagine. Once you've got your needle and knife, this is where it will bleed because the cephalic and its tributaries are very close on near the S portal. You bring in your alpha beta guide and then start assessing where to position it best. Number one, it has to be positioned slightly slanted. So you will notice that the guide is slightly slanted and then your anterior tip is critical because if you're too far anterior, there's going to be a blowout on the promontory. But if you're far too far posterior, then And once you've got both in place and then you know, you're sure that these are parallel and you're happy with them, then you can continue doing the next step. So I usually use the accurate through the D portal to put them underneath the tip of the wires before your drill comes in because accidentally if your wire is pushed distally because your drill and wire are not aligned, you can damage the nerves there. And then you bring in your drills and you drill two holes for the top hat. So always do the alpha first. The alpha is the distal one. And then you come in with the same, remove the wire and then do in the beta. So once you've done your two, the guide will ensure that your two holes are perpendicular 
and they are well positioned in between so you don't have to merge them and there's no fear of uh, the drill holes merging together or exploding the coracoid and then comes in the coracoid tap now this has changed now the coracoid tap has come in differently because we have changed our top hats and the screws materially uh, so we have got a better quality top hats and screws so you tap both the holes but we've switched now over the last four years we've using the top head only in the distal alpha hole we tend not to use the top head in the proximal hole but we still need to tap the proximal hole because the cannula is going to come in and the screw threads are going to capture both the holes so it's desirable to tap both of them on the bottom right you can see the top head coming in and the top head only in the distal alpha hole and once that's flush you're sure that this is appropriately done uh, you can go in and now do the coracoid osteotomy so the osteotomy again is uh, a delicate procedure you want to have a fair distance but not too far proximal to dam damage the conoid and trapezoid the original procedure described that you scribe the coracoid with the osteotome and then bring in a burr to finish off the osteotomy but that's time consuming inherently being lazy i have just use the osteotome throughout, but you need to be very careful that you are not misaligned, you're not fragmenting the coracoid, and uh, the osteotome should come from the original set. So once you've done this, and you're sure you've done the correct length, then uh, the coracoid does float in the wound, and then you can use your captured device to come in and grab the coracoid. Invariably, if you've taken the correct uh, length of the coracoid, as you see in the top, right picture here uh, most of it will be straight but there will be a proximal beak and if there's a proximal beak then that has to be flattened and we need to burr it down to match the shape of the glenoid so for craft congruence what we would do is uh, use a burr from the s portal hold the graph steady and hold the burr as well steady because you are very close to both the nerves it's very important you have a complete control on this and the camera is usually in your first assistant's hand so the top bit has to be burred but at the same time you have to ensure that you're not violating the uh, drill holes and that's why the steel pins are pushed in further so that i know exactly where the beta hole is otherwise you can invariably end up uh, encroaching on the beta hole so keep that steel pin proud so that you know how much you have got to do and that also acts as a reference point of how much you need to flatten and as you come in here sorry i missed a slide there so as you come in here for the graph when you use the same burr and now you are burring down the glenoid so we are looking lateral portal and now we are segregated the subscap away from the glenoid and what you see here on the glenoid and you bring in your burr and you need to flatten in that surface if your glenoid is straight and flat and that's typical for a 15 20 percent glenoid bone loss all you need to do is just decorticate a light dusting is all that is required but sometimes the bone fragment has malunited and creates a bump there which will preclude the coracoid from sitting flush with the glenoid in which case you need to use the burr to flatten and make both the surfaces matching so once you've done that then you can proceed and use uh, start the graft passage which is probably the last part of the whole procedure so you bring in your blue cannula with the two steel pins and then pass it through you've used wissinger rods to lift up the subscap on the top end and the bottom end and then you rotate your graft in such a manner that it is aligned straight on to the anterior glenoid now here you need a little bit of experience a little bit of uh, twisting and turning to ensure that the graft is number one in the lower sector number two it is parallel to the glenoid number three it is not proud and neither is it recessed so it has to be perfectly flush with the glenoid because if it's too proud it's going to cause arthritic uh, changes or it can cause stiffness of the joint if it's too recessed then it beats the very purpose of the blood trajectory so it has to be flush and this is where the retaining the labrum that you can see there can be a pain because an absent labrum is ideal because your visualization is absolutely clear so you can use a messenger and move the labrum back down 
and then ensure that your graph is perfectly well positioned parallel. And once you're sure, take your time on this step because this is tricky. There's a parallax effect. So I would usually shift my scope into two, three different visual portals like the I and the D and the S and 100% make sure that your graft is indeed parallel to the coropoid. And once that is there, then Bob's your uncle, all you have to do is just put it in there and pass in your guide wires. And once the guide wires are there, so the guide wires that come out of the posterior shoulder will uh, be at about 20 to 30 degrees angle to the Wissinger rod that has gone through the glenohumeral joint. And that tells you that your graft is adequately positioned and the screws will have a good alpha angle. Uh, always put in the first uh, alpha screw, that's the lower one that goes through the top head, that's a critical one. And once that is done, you tighten both the screws alternately. And the graft actually will compress. So even there's a minor mismatch between the graft and the host bed, the screws are so well designed that once you tighten the screws, the graft will be imperceptibly blended with the glenoid as you see here. So at the end, once that is done, I go back and put my scope back in the posterior portal, insert one Griffon anchor there at about four o'clock and then pass those sutures into the labrum by indirect suture shuttle technique like so. And the, there are two, three advantages here. Number one, by recreating the labrum anteriorly, it takes another 10, 12 minutes to do this. But by recreating the labrum, I'm providing a proprioceptive force there so that uh, that will help build in the reflex activation of muscles. And I think that's a very vital function of the labrum. And in addition to that, the graft comes in, uh, the labrum comes to hide between the native glenoid and the graft surface, making the graft surface extra articular. So you can still protect the hyaline cartilage of the glenoid. Having done that, and you've checked finally whether everything is positioned adequately and the labrum is strong enough, you tie a knot. And then once this is achieved, then I have no restrictions on these patients. They can start moving as best, as best as they can from the next day, even at 120 degrees, 130 degrees, depending on their pain tolerance. And some of them will actually start moving and then the sling becomes only redundant. They can use the sling, but only in the public domain. At home, I'm happy for them to leave their arm free, do their basic ADLs without any worry of uh, injury or subluxation because that heals the best. At around, uh, this is the post-op X-ray of these patients. We know that the two screws are in the lower sector. And the most important is in this actual film that you see a fantastic 15 degree alpha angle so that the screws are well aligned. So it tells us that the graph is going to heal because the screws are perpendicular and not too high, not too medial, so that we're not worried about suprastapular nerve injury because of the screws. At around between three and six months, I compulsorily, obligatorily do a CT scan 3 to understand healing because the X-ray doesn't give us half the picture. What the C CT scan tells us is immeasurably different from what an X-ray can give you. So all my patients have to get a CT scan done at around the three and six month mark. You get to study your graft and the screw passage, ensure that they are well aligned. And the graft is actually healed because it's not necessary that a graft has to heal fibrous union and non-union are not too uncommon. So at the end, I invite you, all of you must be aware of the 12th Valdezair Advanced Shoulder Course. This is the first time we are doing the Valdezair course in India and you get to sit in Pune and watch it. So it's a different type of hybrid course. We have the Indian component from 8.30 a.m. till 12. And then between 12 to 4 is you get access to the original Valdezair course straight from France. You should be aware that the Valdezair registration in France is about 1100 euro. So we are getting you the top Indian faculty and all the top brains are there as Indian faculty. And of course, you've got another 18 top international surgeons, all the who's who of shoulder. So we hope we can see you here on the 14th to 15th, uh, 14th to 16th of April this year. Our registrations are going through well. We have a couple of surprises for the evening. We'll be declaring them within a week. And that's a bonus for all of you. So this is the first post-pandemic real big meeting that you're all looking forward to. Thank you very much for your attention. It's been a pleasure talking to the Wire, Wire of Global Conference. Mm -hmm.